I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Yes. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed Hallelujah. is the man that trusteth in him. Would you stand to your feet as we get ready to worship God today? I've come to praise him. I've come to magnify him because I can trust him no matter what I'm going through. No matter what's yes. happening. Let's worship the Lord right now. Everyone raise your hands and magnify the Lord today.
magnify you, Lord. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, God is good all the time. All the time. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I'm not going to try to sing it, but we used to sing a song. He's an all-time God. And every time he shows up on time. I saw my wife cringe when I said it. No, I'm not going to try to sing it. I'm not going to try to sing it, but he is always on time. doesn't matter what it is we're going through, whatever, yeah. what it is, what time of the day it is. He's on Come time. Come on, right. He shows up. Yes. He shows up, and he shows out every right. time he shows up. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord. God is good, isn't he? Hallelujah. Good to see all of you here today. You can be seated for a moment. We have some exciting things that we want to do just to, for a second, and we'll get back into worshiping God. This is uh, we we're going to worship God for this as well. We've been worshiping God for this, but during the whole shutdown situation over the last 18 months and all that stuff, we were, God was able to bless the, God was able at any time to bless the church, but he blessed the church, uh, and we were able to pay off uh, our building that we're in today, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful for that. So today we have, we have a, uh, uh, an envelope, and the bishop's going to come and help me, and uh, we're going to burn uh, the uh, burn uh, uh, a semblance of the mortgage. Uh, it's just saying it's paid off and paid and clear. If you want to come up here, we'll I want to give Bishop a chance to talk. We moved into this building in uh, 2006. Is that right? 2005. 2005. Was it six? Okay, it was six. We'll get it right. We moved into this building, and it had red carpet. It had globes hanging from the ceiling, and it had dark paneling on the walls. I'll never forget it. And it had pews that stretched to the walls. They went all the way to the walls in one center aisle. I believe it's that right, something like that. And we came in, and we gutted this place down to the studs. And uh, with the Lord's help, we were able to We cut all the pews down. Got them in, and I'm, aren't you glad we got chairs now, not pews anymore? We 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 completely redid this place. This it looks completely different than what it what it did when we first got into it. And God is blessed, and God has blessed us, and continues to bless us. And we're looking forward to filling this place up and and, and uh, moving into uh, the next place on flat ground. I'm claiming it now. I'm claiming it now. God is gonna do some great things, and I'm looking forward to it. So we're going to burn this thing, but I want to give it to the bishop and let him te give a testimony before we do. Just a quick one. I'm thankful for everything that God has done and everything that he's doing and everything that he's about to do. I'm looking forward to a great revival to many more souls that, have come, that will come into the church, many more souls that go to that baptistry. Amen. It's all about God's work. Amen. And when we turn it to him, we commit everything to him. Everything's okay. Uh, he, Lord bless you. Why don't we worship the Lord? Thank Jesus. you for all his many blessings. Hallelujah. Jesus, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I glorify you, Lord. Jesus, I worship you, Lord. Man, God is good. He's good all the time. We're going to take a moment to receive our offering. Uh, we're going to say a blessing over the offering, and then we're going to allow you to bring it. It's up here, and we're going to allow you to re bring your offering to the Lord. God is good, and he's blessed, and I'm thankful for everything he's done and everything he's doing. And so if you want to bring your tithes and offering, well, let's pray right now over it. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now. You are an awesome God. You're an on-time God, and I thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for this church. 
I thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing for this church, God. Uh, Lord Jesus, I ask you to bless, Lord, this offering we're about to give to you, Lord, to bring to you, Lord. Uh, I'm asking you to bless those that have and have not. Uh, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to bless every person in this building, Lord. Uh, help it, Lord, uh, to have further your truth, uh, further your message in this city, God. Uh, Lord Jesus, have your way, Lord, in our lives, uh, in the hearts of your people today, God. Uh, Lord, in Jesus' name, we praise you. In Jesus' name, we magnify you. Would you bring your offerings to the Lord today?
used to remind my parents of promises. They would say, we're going to do something. And then I thought they forgot. So I would say, but you said, you promised, you said we would do this. I think sometimes God likes to be reminded of his promises. He said, if you call on his name, he would be there. He said that his anointing would break every yoke. right now and just love the Lord right now. He's in this place. Oh God, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You are holy. You are holy. Oh God, you are wonderful. Mighty. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let him speak to you in this place today. Lord, you're worthy to be praised. You're wonderful, God. You're the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Oh, Jesus, you're the lily of the valley, the bride and the morning star. Oh, yes, Lord. mighty God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. Oh, there's something about the presence of the Lord. When we begin to gather together, we begin to worship Him. And He steps into the midst. He comes into this place and I'm thankful that I can feel His presence and I can know that He is here. Lord Jesus. What an awesome God. What an awesome God. What a powerful presence of the Lord is in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's exciting to see all of you here today, all of our home folk, all of our visitors. First, I want to say thank you to each and every person that calls New Vision their home. Each and every one of you are important, and each and every one of you are vital in the ministry and the work of the kingdom of God in Huntsville across our world. I'm excited about what God is doing in your life. In all of our lives. Lord Jesus, you wonderful Lord. I want to thank all of you that were here yesterday to help us with the cleaning and fixing and things of that nature. We got things knocked out and some things worked on. I want to thank all of you that helped last week with our, uh, our uh, homeless outreach 
that was a huge success. I think they said uh, roughly 60 or so people came through the line and uh, they were able to get clothing, they were able to get a, a, a warm meal, and they were able to get a good conversation with some people. And I'm thankful for all of you that were able to uh, be there and those of you that prepared and were able to give uh, before that time. If you couldn't be there but you were praying, I want to thank you for doing that because God was there in the, the place. If you were, uh, weren't here yesterday and but you've been praying uh, for the services, I want to thank you for doing that because your prayer is just as important as being here. You need to be here. You need to pray. You need to seek God and uh, ask God to move in the services and that. You need to be here, but you need to make sure you get a hold of God and say, God, I want you to be here. It's one thing for me to be here, but I want God here. I don't want to just be here by myself. I, I want, I've come to see Jesus. I've come to see Him work through us uh, in everything we do. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful all of the visitors are here. Good to see each and every one of you. I will not try to name names because I will mess it up. I'm thankful this morning for my wife uh, leading the music, taking care of things, making sure we got everything cleaned up that we were supposed to get cleaned up. Uh, uh, working on the live stream, and I trust those that are watching on the live stream are able to hear us. She worked hard on that, and I'm thankful for that. Got things fixed up with that. I, I couldn't do it without you, baby. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Lord Jesus. Uh, she's the pastor. I'm just here. <laughs> oh, God is good all the time. And I'm thankful for my family and and I'm thankful for each and every one of you. I'm thankful for the bishop and his wife. For 20 years ago, they felt a call to come to South Huntsville and start a church here. One had been here, but had not uh, uh, was not in existence at the time, I guess. And, and uh, God had put on their heart, there needs to be a church in South Huntsville. They came and they uh, poured everything they had into this church, and I'm thankful for them because uh, they answered the call. And now 20 years later, we have a church in South Huntsville. The Pentecostals of South Huntsville are growing, and we're here to stay. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And it is so good to have my friend, uh, brother and sister uh, Sadler, with us today. I'm thankful that they decided to come. They're going to be here again this evening. If you are uh, uh, available and can be here tonight, if you're a family uh, family of this church, if you're in this church, then you need to be here tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to continue this anniversary celebration. God is going to move in a mighty way tonight. Find somebody and bring them with you, and they are going to uh, feel the presence of God, I know as well. Come early for prayer. That's tonight. That's tonight, and we are excited about what is going to happen. But this morning... I want to uh, invite uh, the Saddlers uh, to this pulpit today. I want them to take their liberty. I want God to move in a mighty way. And I want each and every one of us in this place, if you would stretch your hands towards this pulpit and you would begin to pray with me, that God would take uh, His liberty in our lives. His will would be done, not our will. His desire would, uh, would be uh, fulfilled in this place in each and every one of us. Open our hearts and our minds that we can receive. Would you do that right now with me, Lord Jesus? I'm asking you right now, Lord, to touch, to move, to strengthen. God, uh, Lord, uh, the speaker, as he begins to preach your word, God, uh, Lord, touch, uh, Lord, brother and sister Sadler, Lord, that they might be free to work in, in you, God. Uh, let, take, let them take their liberty, Lord, with you, O oh God, uh, guiding and leading them in how to flow, God. And Lord, open our hearts and minds that we can receive everything, Lord, uh, that you would have for each and every one of us. Uh, would you magnify the Lord today? I'm inviting Brother Sadler to come to this pulpit. Let's uh, preach the Word with him. In the Lord good. Amen. You may be seated today. So good to see everyone in the house of the Lord. We, uh, I actually got to sleep later this morning driving from Smyrna here than I normally do, and so I feel refreshed. I, I've got an hour and a half sermon ready. Did, didn't say I was going to let it go. I just said I've, I've got it ready. 
and uh, so we have several things we need to take care of today. It's an important day. Uh, I shared with Brother Sister Giratana this morning that in our church we have a collage of photos, and in that one of those photos is Brother and Sister Giratano. They had visited us in their agenda. I don't think it was common knowledge at the time, but they were praying about uh, launching a church in South Huntsville. They want to kind of see what we were doing. And so we have a kindred spirit. We have a similar birth date uh, as far as starting churches. And so our hearts are knit together. We did not know Brother Sister Sergeant until some years later. And uh, we have got to be friends. Uh, we have met several times. Uh, in the community of Fettville and eaten some fried chicken, the Lord's chicken. Everybody say the Lord's chicken. And uh, so, and we we uh, they have come and blessed our church. And so we just so much think the world of them and of these beautiful girls. They are awesome. Everybody say awesome. And I, I hear about preachers' kids having a pitiful existence. I can just say. It's the best thing in the world. It is a privilege. Even when you don't feel like it, it is a privilege to work for the Lord and be in uh, the family of God. And so I want to recognize them. I am praying for some good apostolic young men. They, they got the right bait. Let's let the Lord send the right man. Don't settle. Don't settle. Don't settle. Right man. And so God's going to bless you. I just love the Spirit, and uh, I love what He's doing. I don't. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize today is not only uh, 20 years of this church and our connection with the Giratanas and our friendship with Brother and Sister Sergeant. Today is their 10th pastoral anniversary. Yes, that's a good thing. I tell people in Smyrna, I know we're on the edge of revival. And they say, oh, Pastor, have you been to the prayer room? I said, no. I have a different litmus test for if revival's coming. If there's nobody I hate to see coming, or I can't sense anybody hates to see me coming, there's going to be revival. Because when we love one another, and I've been around your pastor and his wife, they love their people. They, uh, they love souls. And so I'm thankful for that. I was torn. You didn't know this. We started the church in Smyrna. I was really torn. Should I come back to my hometown? Hey, school is my hometown. Should I come back here and start a United Pentecostal Church? And it gave me great comfort to know that I was in Smyrna and there was going to be apostolic preaching going on. It gave me comfort now that Brother and Sister Sergeant are here. Ten years, hasn't it gone by fast? Now, if you look up the list for gifts on the various anniversaries, the 10th anniversary is signified with, everybody say, 10. T-I-N. 10. The irony, ten. To, I'm sorry, Could, couldn't couldn't resist it. I had thought about stopping at a convenience store and getting you a can of Sprite, but that's aluminum, and that wouldn't work. If you look at the uses of tin, its primary use in the United States of America is to solder. In other words, connect wires or plumbing pipes together. I can't think of a better example of a pastor is somebody who keeps things together that there can be flow of electricity or flow of water or flow of the Spirit and you fill in the blank. I am so thankful that we're at 10. Jeremiah 3 and 15 says, I will give you pastors according to my heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Aren't you thankful that God has put a man in this church that not only loves you, but desires that you understand and know the Word of God and the will of God for your life. Now, before I recognize Sister Olivia, I want Julie to come. We have a gift from the Pentecostals this morning for you and Sister Sergeant, but Sergeant, I want you to come on behalf of the Pentecostals of Smyrna. Uh, you can just call us your sister church. Uh, this is my brother from another mother. My sister from another mister. Come on, somebody help me. I just got a little something for them. And Sister Olivia, from this great New Vision Apostolic Church, she has... We have a representation of all of our thankfulness 
and how much we appreciate your guys' hard work and ministry. And we thank you so much. Yes. Oh, we, thank you. We we love each and every one of you, and you guys are you guys are the greatest. I love I love it. Uh, even uh, uh, whenever we say, "Oh, there's going to be something come," uh, we got to do and take care of. Yes, everybody says, oh, "How can we help? What can we do?" We want to we want to make sure we take care of it. Yesterday, I forgot to get a hold of Brother Otha and tell him we were working at the church, and he showed up on his bike and said, "Is there anything I can do? I want to be here." And I'm thankful for each and every one of you, and I'm thankful for everything that you guys do, and I'm thankful for your love for each and every for us. I'm so thankful y'all are patient. <laughs> I, I told somebody the other day I'm the world's okayest piano player ever, and and I'm the world's okayest musician, singer, whatever. But my people are so awesome, and I love you guys, and thank you for just worshiping through every bag chord and every missed note. And, and for worshiping with us instead of just watching. That says a lot for a church. It really does. Thank you. Give me another hand clap today. Thank you for everything you do. Sister Sergeant, if this pastor's wife thing falls through, you've got a career in decorating and design. I feel that she could travel the country and decorate churches. She'd do a great job. Amen. I am glad to have my wife with me today. We we have been in St. Louis all week at headquarters, and uh, we drove uh, to our house and made sure our cat was still alive. And then we got up early this morning and came in. It's our privilege. can't imagine why you would ask me, but I am so humbled and appreciative that you would. And I'm so glad to have some fellow Tennesseans, Brother and Sister Curtis, whom we love. Brother Larry and I have been friends for 20-something years. We don't claim it do it's too long and we're so glad they are here today we love their spirit he is a man who loves souls and uh, he's got a ministry that god has blessed and is going to continue to bless and i'm going to preach a little bit about that in just a few minutes for the curtis i want to hear some amens i think and if you got your bibles today i hope i hadn't forgotten anything i i'm just a preacher that's what i do i just love the word of the lord i love his people i like to make connection and so i may get a little animated if that scares you, you better hang on to your neighbor. But if we're not excited about the Word of God, who's going to be excited about it? If we don't profess and proclaim it, who else is going to profess and proclaim it? So tonight, if the Lord tarries, it would be my intent to go back to a fundamental apostolic doctrine, and that is God is a healer. Too many people have glossed over that and said, well, that was a yesterday thing. Healing is a today thing. God's Spirit is healing people daily, hourly, and even by the minute. And so tonight we're going to look at healing. But this morning, Psalms 84, Sister BJ, start with verse 1. Isn't she awesome? I love good technical people. And I'm reading today in the King James, the Bible says, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself. Let me stop and insert something there. The sparrow and the swallow were the least important or most insignificant of the sacrifices to the Lord, but they found a place to inhabit in the house of the Lord. If you feel inferior or insignificant today, you're in the perfect place in the sanctuary of God where she may lay her young. I don't know where you've been, but if you will bring your children to the house of the Lord, God can do things in them and through them. I'm glad for college funds. I'm glad for careers and programs. But there is nothing that will outdo what the house of the Lord will do through your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren today. Here's what the Word says. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. I want to preach a little bit today about being saved 
in the sanctuary. Say that again. Saved in the sanctuary. Jesus today, I know in our ears to hear. God, stir our hearts. God, give us revelation and understanding. Let not today be just any other day, but today is a day that I've declared in my heart that I'm going to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I have made up my mind that going to church is not an option. When it's the Lord's day, I'm going to be in the Lord's house. God, give me a passion and a desire always to congregate together with Your people that I can feel joy and peace and love, that there could be an opportunity for salvation and deliverance and healing God even today give us power and authority over our own minds and God let us be empowered and set on fire afresh from above that our passion would not burn out but our desire always is to be in the sanctuary of the most high God and let the church say amen why don't you give your neighbor a fist bump before you're seated today trying to be covid cognizant by fist bumping I told the church this morning why don't you give your neighbor an air high five and two or three people got poked in the eye so I hadn't done that again we have some uncoordinated people in morning, I guess I was reading from this psalm today 84 it is a context of the emotion of the heart that there were the sons of Korah that had developed a music ministry. They began to write songs about what was penetrating their heart and where their emotions were set. How many country songs has been written at a low point of emotional status? And these sons of Korah began to write about how beautiful and how much they long for the house of the Lord. Let me say today, being in the great state of Alabama in 1993 in Holly Springs, Alabama, on a Palm Sunday morning, a pastor on the day before had ordered a floral arrangement to set on a table in front of the pulpit much like this today. He said, could you please Sunday morning deliver some fresh flowers for Palm Sunday? And the young lady that owned the floral shop said, sure, Pastor. He said, the door will be unlocked. You can come straight in, come to the foyer, come to the sanctuary, put the flowers. We'll put you a check in the mail next week. She said, I'll take care of it. She came to deliver the flowers, and on her way out, an EF4 tornado was topping the hill. This beautiful glass for your glass on this side, glass on this side, glass on this side. She had nowhere to go. She couldn't get to her vehicle, didn't know what to do. So she ran back through the oak doors back into the sanctuary that had no windows and dove under a pew. And the EF4 tornado totally destroyed the church. She was interviewed later that day by a local news affiliate. And when the journalist said, hey, what happened? She told what I just told that she ran back into the sanctuary and she said what was it like Have you ever noticed the people who go through the worst stuff that have almost a legitimate excuse not to give God glory how many times do we hear people climb out of the rubble of an earthquake or a tornado and say I just thank God when it's not if trouble comes it's when trouble comes you'll get a revelation of what is important they said how did you make it she said I got out of the foyer and I was saved in the sanctuary I'm telling somebody today if we'll get off the porch if we'll get out of the foyer of hanging out if we'll get out of the fellowship hall and we'll get into the sanctuary where the very presence of God dwells where he can speak a word to your heart he can wash your eyes that you can see he can speak a delivering word of the Holy Ghost that will transform you you too can be saved say I can be saved in the sanctuary come on give me just a few minutes today what I want to preach about is that we are in treacherous times you know those perilous times they was telling us about This is them. The psalmist in 84 is telling them, hey, I'm writing a song 
telling you that it's a pilgrimage. You need to know this. In the mind of God from the beginning, when He selected a people, He chose a city. That city is set upon seven hills. I want you to know geographically, Jerusalem is the very center of the world. And God said, I know you're busy and I know you need farmlands for your livestock, but I have declared some holy days that you need to come to the temple and worship me. I know it's uphill. And you can tell me how hard it is on Sunday morning and Billy won't sit still and Susie won't leave the curlers in her hair and the, I could sleep and I got to work tomorrow and I got a sink full of dishes. But do you know what? Do you know why they went there? Not only because God expected it, it's because the trip is worth it when we get up. Can I just say this today? If you have to debate in your mind whether I'm going to church tomorrow or not, you're asking the wrong question. You need to wake up and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I know I got dishes in the sink. I got to work tomorrow. But today is the Lord's day, and I'm going to the house of the Lord because if I can get in the sanctuary, I can be saved. It's worth it. Now, anybody here got excuses? Okay, wait, wait, wait. Anybody got troubles? Anybody got family troubles? Everybody's a blessing. Some by coming, some by going. Hallelujah. Ain't no trouble like family trouble, right? But I got this situation going on in my marriage. I got this problem going on with my kids. I got this problem with my boss. I got this financial deficit I'm into. I got all these situations. Now, you know that Psalms 84, that song talking about the trip is worth it. The sons of Korah also wrote Psalms 48. It's a companion song. They go together. And chapter 48 of Psalm goes on to say that Zion, that holy hill, is beautiful for situation. I don't know what situation you got, but if you're having problems in your marriage, there's no better place to go than the house of the Lord for it's beautiful for situations. You're having trouble with your finances. I can't think of a better place to go than to the house of the Lord for it is beautiful for situations. Depression is eating you up when nobody can know it and nobody seems to care, but I can come to the sanctuary for it's beautiful for situations. I got this affliction in my body and I can't move but the sanctuary is beautiful for situations there is no situation that God did not make provision to be met in the sanctuary y'all y'all okay? okay you feeling what I'm feeling I'm skipping stuff for your sake today disclaimer who likes a good disclaimer now, I'm not talking about people with real issues, real concerns. That you're at a high risk for catching COVID. That's real. I've lost friends from COVID. I, I've, I've, people that I looked up to have, have struggled and have not quite recovered. So it's real. I respect it. But let me also say that in a pseudo post COVID world, we got people that are not really in high risk. They just don't want to shave. Th did I say that out loud? I just don't feel like wrestling the kids today. It's just so easy to get on the computer. Let me stop and say this. It is a resource. I am so thankful that pre-COVID that the Pentecostals of Smyrna, not because I'm this smart, because God's this good, we had made a heavy investment in online footprint. If we hadn't have, we would have been in a bad place. I respect it. But it is a tool on our tool belt. It is not the only tool. I've got a friend, Brother Terry Arnold, who's had COVID. He's been in the hospital. Until this week, he hadn't had anything to eat since like the 19th of June. And if you know Brother Terry Arnold, he's like me. He likes to eat. When he has free time, he likes to peruse menus of restaurants he might go to later in the week. 
His last verse is, the fat is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He, he loves it. And I was texting Brother Terry. They sent him to a rehab hospital. He's been in a long recovery. He had to have a heart procedure because COVID did something to his heart. He already had some heart issues, but it made it worse. And so he went and had valve replacement, and then he went into, had to be put on a ventilator, and it was touch and go for a while. For the Curtis's uh, bishop uh, had been his pastor, and he's calling Brother uh, Becton to make funeral arrangements. He thinks this is the end. He makes a turn for the better by prayer. And I text him, and I said, man, how you doing? He said, well, I'm thankful they put me on this liquid diet. I said, like, like jello and, and shakes. He said, no, it's one of those feeding tubes. He said, it's kept me alive. I'm thankful for that. I said, forgive me in advance. I said, Terry, you think about just staying on that liquid diet when you get out of the hospital? He said, when I get out of here, I'm getting to the first Longhorn Steakhouse. And I'm getting me. <clears throat> Can I tell you, that online service might keep you alive. It might sustain you. It might fill a void. But it is not an adequate substitute for coming to the house. If you're watching online and you got real issues, I respect it. But if you don't, you just don't want to shave. And you, There is no substitute for coming to the sanctuary. There are things that can only be imparted when you get together in one mind and one accord. I'm thankful for technology and I'm not preaching against it. But God in His eternal wisdom from the foundation of the world, He knew there would be an internet one day. He knew they'd be streaming one day. But He still said I think the church and assembling together in the name is more important than a tech see God had an eternal he, he knew the beginning and the end but he still said the church what are you talking about today I want to be saved in the sanctuary, don't you? There is no situation you can't go through that it's not beautiful for a solution for that situation I love judges. Brother Gertano, sister, you knew my granddad. Pretty hard nosed on some things. They didn't have a TV most of their life. Can you imagine being a hyperactive kid, six, seven, eight years old? I met Momo and Papa, so they don't have any TV. Ah, so cool. They found great things to do. I learned how to sew on rainy days. I learned how to split wood and work in the garden on sunny days. And when it was nap time, I think they needed the nap for me. I was wide awake. My granddad would get me in that red and all hide reclining chair and tell me these stories. And I, son, what do you want to hear? Something from the judges, Papa. I loved it, Samson. Love those vivid characters. Kids talk about Marvel comics. Man, we had the judges. Awesome. Only one woman judge. Judges 5 talks about a lady named Deborah. Sister Sergeant, I don't mean to embarrass you, but something about her makes me think of you. Now, she's not judging y'all. But she sees something. And she don't necessarily get big on permission. She just does it. If it makes sense to her, get out of her way. Honey, hold this. What are we doing? Just hold it. Go charge how am I doing? I'm on it. But do you know how Deborah became listed as one of the judges? She had the heart of a mother. She walked out into the streets. And the highways that led to Jerusalem, that she's looking at her calendar, and it's time to go to Jerusalem, and nobody was going to Jerusalem. If you do a little research, you realize, do you remember, there, there was a good Samaritan? Well, there was a bad Samaritan that was a robber, and cutthroat bandits were up and down the highways and made people afraid to obey what God had called them to do. It's what Deborah said. Oh God, if you will empower me, if you give me authority, I will not let your roads remain empty. 
if you will anoint me for a purpose that your people can get to your house. She didn't have to fast and pray. The mighty hand of God reached out and gave her authority, caused her to find favor with the people. And in less than three years, she reestablished the road that people may go to the house of the Lord. Any mamas in here? You need to say, I don't care what you say. I'm loading these babies up and I'm going to the house of the Lord. I'm not missing church. In the mind of God on the day of Pentecost, it was when they were together. They wasn't watching on a live stream. I'm by myself in here today. When they came in one mind and one accord, that's when the Spirit began to move. There's a connectivity of believers. When two or three are gathered in His name, He will show up and show out. When we come to the house of the Lord in the sanctuary, we expect God to visit us and deliver us. i got just a few more references. Y'all started at a different time, man. I... We'd just be having worship in Smyrna right now. So I, by my watch, i got 55 more minutes. Y'all are scared. Y'all are scared. Here's what I'm saying. It was David that famously said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Do you know the story behind the story? Think about David's history. David was anointed king, but it was 20 years later before he actually became king. How many times do we feel God call us and save us, but if he doesn't do everything we want done in three or four weeks, we lose interest and drift out of the church? Anybody here eating one jelly donut and gaining 40 pounds? You know, eat one donut and gain... No, 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 I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Can you go to the gym one day and lose 40 pounds? Doesn't work that way either. Everybody say process. And God works on us in a process. Although he saw the right kind of heart in David, there was still a process he was working on, David, that he would have the right mind. He had the heart, but he needed the mind to be king. And 20 years of the process, notice when Saul was about to destroy him, prophets were being killed and priests were in hiding because Saul had lost vision for the mission and his purpose. When David couldn't pick anywhere better to go, he said, there's a tabernacle. There's a priest in Nob. If I can just get to that sanctuary. We got immigrants that are fighting to get into certain cities that are known as sanctuary cities. I'm not being political today. Where that term comes from, it's a biblical term that if you were caught in a manslaughter, even if you'd murdered somebody, if you could get to the sanctuary and grab the horns of the altar until you were heard, you could not be killed. I'm telling you, we need to get a sanctuary mentality no matter where we've been or what we've done. If I can but get to the sanctuary and I can get to the altar, I know that my case will be heard and it will be imputed to me. His righteousness for my unrighteousness, His blood for my unworthiness if I can but get to the sanctuary. David said, I'm going to the sanctuary. He got looking. Bread. Everybody say bread. Ooh, I can fast everything but bread. You, people say bread can't talk. I can hear it call in my name. There can be a slice of chocolate cake in the refrigerator because I've portioned it where I'm not eating more than I should. About 11.30 at night, Brother G. The Lord is trying to help me resist temptation. I can resist everything but temptation. And that chocolate cake is calling my name. David went there and the priest said, hey, I got some bread that will sustain you. Can I tell you what? God's got a word in His sanctuary. When people say, I don't know if there is a God and I'm not believing... I've never met anybody who's getting the regular diet of the living bread that doesn't think God is real. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you're struggling and you're believing and you're not hearing God speak to you, could it be that you're not in the sanctuary where God's prepared some bread to sustain you? We, David went to the sanctuary and he got bread. 
I had a favorite restaurant that was famous. Something between a cheese biscuit and a cheddar bay biscuit. Y'all just, I lost some of y'all right there. Oh, my. My body's still here, but my mind's at Cracker Barrel. I, I know y'all. I know y'all. Do you know what? They quit serving that bread. I quit going to that restaurant. If I ain't going to get no bread, I'm going to just go somewhere else. They shut down a few years later. They said they couldn't afford to give away the bread. They couldn't afford not to. Churches that are closing. Listen, when the world's at its worst, the church is at its best. Hey, people who never thought to try church are trying to church. I had lunch this week with Brother Hanson, new superintendent of Portland, former Metro Missions director. He and I speak the same language. He looked at me and said, Brother Sadler, I'm out there in Oregon. You've seen us in the news. Yeah. He said, I live about three miles from that compound that's run amok in Portland. He said, but do you know what? Because of that craziness, I got people that have been New Agers their whole life, people that have dropped acid their whole life, people that will experience anything but believe nothing, and they're coming to the church. He said, I, he said about six weeks ago, I had a guy that had been a New Age priest that used acid to connect with the spirits of the universe. Kim, and he brought his acid and he put it in the offering plate. And he said, Pastor, I've been looking for something. I've been doing every drug I can think of. He said, I found exactly what I was looking for. He didn't find it at Walmart. He didn't find it under Buddha. He didn't find it in the world. He found it in the sanctuary. All that acid that ate up his mind, Brother Hanson says, God has begun to unravel the craziness in his mind. He wakes up and realizes what he's done. He remembers things that he had forgotten because of the effects of drugs. My God is able to restore the years that the enemy has destroyed in the sanctuary. Is where he can do it today. While David was there getting bread for his immediate need, guess what else he found? The priest said, you know that sword that you took off of Goliath? Woo! He's, David said, there's not, not one like that one. Woo, that's a super sword. He said, I've got it wrapped over here, hidden under the altar. Can I tell you, when we come back to the sanctuary, some of y'all might have forgotten what God's done in your past. Some of y'all might have forgotten who you once were. And you got weary and well-doing. But if you'll stay in the sanctuary, He'll cause you to remember from whence you come and how faithful God has been. I imagine David had been questioning, did I hear God's voice? Did I really have the anointing on me? Did I understand that I was going to be king? And I'm weary and I'm tired of running. And I came in the sanctuary and I got bread for my body. And then I saw the sword that reminded me. God is faithful. God did give me the victory. Here's the evidence of great glory of previous victories. When we come to the house of the Lord, He reminds us. You know what, you know what the devil likes to do to us? He likes to get us focused on the wrong thing. We get focused on what our neighbor may have and we have not. That's what Satan did in the garden. Look it up when you get home. Thousands of fruits, berries, nut trees. There was even a tree of life that they were not forbidden to eat of. What did he get them focused on, Brother Curtis? That one tree, you can't eat that. If you're not careful, he'll let the devil get you focused on the, the have not. Instead of what I have. I, I, I don't have a big old house. Oh, but I got a room in a mansion in glory. I don't have much silver or gold, but I'm going to a place that the streets are paved with gold. Well, I ain't got no mama. I ain't got no daddy. You have a heavenly father who gives good and perfect gifts. In him, there's no shadow of turning. There's no variableness. He's not hot and cold. He's not fickle. He doesn't renege. He doesn't take his word back. He is faithful, righteous, and true. Let us remember that God has blessed us. 
I got two more points. Can you handle it? Psalm 72. The songwriter who was an assistant to David wrote this song. We forget when we hear psalms, we, we think of funeral text. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall. But this is really music. Does anybody here know your ABC? You're super smart. I know you are. Who knows your ABC? How did most of us learn our ABC? Singing. A, B, C, D. It, it made sense of it for us. We at least knew it in a missed syllable we missed a letter. Okay. There is a power when, the, when you put the truth of God with music. And this song leader it, it is broken hearted because he, he's close to the king and he knows he has purpose and calling. And he sees David and, and David's getting to a period in his life where he's drifting a little bit. And this worship leader looks and sees the state of comfortableness in the golden age of Israel. Do you remember what happened to David when he should have went to war and stayed home? He got his eyes on the wrong thing. This worship leader starts seeing and he gets redirected and he starts thinking about what all. And he says, look, they're not going to church three times a week and they're being blessed. They're not giving tithes and offerings, and they seem to have plenty of money. They don't honor God in their home, and their kids turned out pretty good. Why do I have to give and sacrifice at this level? Well, you don't know the conclusion of the matter. Because it ain't always what it looks like. It looks like they're prosperous, but you don't have any mortgages they got on that house. They look like the perfect family, but you don't know what goes on there when nobody else is around. And you don't know where they're going to end up either. My focus is not to be like my neighbor. Most neighbors are broke, drunk, dysfunctional, divorced. I could keep going. My standard is not to be up to my neighbor. I'm going to preach to the church for just a minute. And my anointing doesn't speak to me to encourage you to do better. God hadn't called you to do better. Well, I only smoked three joints this week instead of seven. Well, that's better. God hadn't called us to be better. He's called us to be our best. Living up to His potential in our lives. I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be everything God's called me and equipped me to be, and I can't be that apart from His sanctuary. In Psalms 72 and 73, it talks about this guy lamenting. They're getting away with it. I'm doing all this extra work, and they're getting away. I'm doing without things, and they're getting away with it. They're doing just as good as me, and look at what I'm giving up. Poor pitiful me. Now, if you want to have a pity party, the devil will fiddle. Oh, baby, you're so right. They don't appreciate your ministry. They don't see your sacrifice. Oh, baby, why don't you just show them what's what? And the psalmist said, and the devil had me. He said, my feet were nigh unto slipping. I was already coming off the rock. I was going down. But verses 16 and 17 of that same chapter goes on to say, he says, until I got in the sanctuary what the word says. When I got in the sanctuary, I remembered. I felt the Spirit of God again. I was reminded this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun that God has called me out of this world. It's when we get in the sanctuary that we are reminded of our purpose. I never finished telling you when David said to his servants when Absalom had rebelled and was overthrowing him and they're fleeing, they were going to grab the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, David wasn't pleased that the Ark was lost. And he first took a program of oxen and men and carts. And Uzzah steadied the Ark and he died. How serious is God about His Word? He's dead serious. But David didn't let it stop him for when he heard that the house of Obed-Edom was blessed because the Ark was there. Guess what he said? 
can't let it stay there where it blesses one man. I need it back in Jerusalem where everybody's blessed, where atonement and mercy is available for everybody. And David went back in the Word and found out how the ark of God was to be moved. It's been called to be moved by men and women with an anointing and a purpose and a calling to develop the plan for the sanctuary to have a move of God. They said, we know the ark is important to you, David. We're going to grab it and take it with us. He says, no. No. He says, if God preventures, if, if it's in the mind of God to bring me back here and let me be king, okay. But if he doesn't, God is in control and the people are going to need an ark of mercy in the midst of the sanctuary. It's not based on brother and sister sergeant. God's got a church. He's got a sanctuary where mercy is administered to those who bow their knees and confess to God and He cleanses them. It's not controlled by one man. It's controlled by the man. Jesus Christ. Close with this. You have music if they want to play. Because I think some people are going to make a commitment today in this place. I read in the Miami Post-Herald of a young boy named Scotty Cruz. Scotty, seven, almost eight years old, gotten off the school bus in front of the house there in suburbia Miami. Mommy, mommy, can I go play soccer in the backyard until supper time? Well, honey, you've got homework. He says, oh, but mom, let me play, and when supper's over, I won't complain. I'll do my homework then. Sister Mickey, Mama's standing at the kitchen sink, washing dishes and keeping an eye on the stove. Little Scotty's in the backyard. She turns her head to stir something on the stove. She comes back. An 11-foot alligator has come out of that canal and has come through an opening in the fence and has got Scotty in his mouth up to the waist. He is screaming and hollering. She drops the dish. She runs out the door. 115 pound mother, 11 foot alligator. She went out there and pulled and kicked and yelled. The gator took his snout and knocked her to her feet. She's laying there seeing her baby clenched in the teeth of this alligator. She takes back her right foot. And she kicks him in the eye as hard as she can. It stuns him for just a second, enough to loosen his grip. And she was able to dig her claws in that flesh of that precious baby and pull him out of that gator's mouth. Uh, he's in the hospital for weeks. Touch and go. Don't know if he's going to live. Internal injuries. Lost a lot of blood. Torn flesh all over his body. Finally, when they realized he was going to make it, they brought in a plastic surgeon, one of the best in the Miami area. He took the job pro bono. He said, I just want to help this young man not to be scarred the rest of his life. They brought him in. And the surgeon said, well, hey, Scotty, I'm Dr. So-and-so. Hey, Doc. He said, I'm here to help you. I, I want to make where your scars are minimized or go away. Can you show me? He says, well, Doc, do you want to see my good scars? Are my bad scars. Ooh, what do you mean good scars are bad? He said, my bad scars is where the gator's teeth tore my flesh. But my good scars is where mama dug her, her fingernails in my flesh and delivered me a lot. When you think pastor and pastor's wife's being mean to you, they're not hurting you. They're trying to save you. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He will sneak in when you least expect it. He wants to devour you. I know this is a Catholic thing, but I still believe the church is the mother to the lost. We don't give up on people. Well, they're in jail. There's no hope for them. I got wardens begging me to come into the prisons because... All their programs, resources, and money is not making a difference. But the church is going to make the difference. Rehabbing halfway houses with monies and buildings 
are not having the result of church-based CR. Halfway houses where they have a local church of brothers and sisters and tell them, you can make it. You can make it. You can make it. I'm with you. I'm with you. If we can just get to the sanctuary, anything's possible. I know what you've done in your past, but God can restore what the enemy has sought to destroy in you. <laughs> my hometown. My hometown. It ain't the same as when I was a kid, people. I could ride my bicycle anywhere in Huntsville when I was a kid. There's some parts of Huntsville where I grew up, I'd be afraid to go outside in the daytime. Is that okay? I grew up off Maston Lake. Hopo. Everywhere, thank God. Do you know what's going on? Turn this town upside down? Woo! If we turn this city upside down, it'd be really right side up because it's already upside down. What, what's going to save the city? It ain't going to be who the governor is or not. It ain't going to be who the mayor is or is not. It's going to be a shining light set up on the hill. It's people of God that said, I've come to the sanctuary unworthy and unclean. But when I came here, God did a work in my life. I'm not what I used to be. Come with me. There is fresh bread. There's a sword of the Spirit that can give you the victory. As my sister sings today, I'm going to get out of the way. I want this pastor to come and stand. If you're going to stand with this pastor, if you've made up your mind that I'm going to be in the house of the Lord, I'm going to be a part of changing the culture of my city. I'm going to make a difference for a lost and dying world. I want you to come and pray. Participate with your pastor. Agree together with him that you're going to make a difference.